Financial independence is having the ability to fill as many of those time slots as possible with meaningful, purposeful climbs. So if your meaningful, purposeful climb is your job and your job pays your monthly needs, guess what? You're financially independent from the moment you start that job. Yeah. And I think this is where we make the mistake. Money is a tool and it's a tool that we use to do other more important things. The problem is most of the financial independence community and people in general feel like money is the goal. Mm. And so what happens when you have enough money and money is the goal? You just set a higher goal. Yeah! What's up, everybody? Your life alchemist, your dragon. Welcome to Alchemize Life. I'm your host, Justin David Carl. This is a show where I seek out and share expertise, wisdom, and thought leadership in all domains with the mission of empowering and inspiring you to proactively design and truly live a life worth living. We're all in this together. And when we do the work together, we go so much farther, so much faster, and have so much more fun. Without further ado, let's dig into this episode and alchemize life. Doc G, so good to have you on the show, brother. I'm so happy to be here. Let's kick off with one of your defining moments in your younger years. So one of my major defining moments was actually a huge failure. My mom had just remarried and we moved from one town to the next. I had no friends. I had just started high school and I had a deep drive to play basketball on the basketball team. In fact, I had been practicing all summer and I got to tryouts and about three days into a full week of tryouts, I lost it. I lost my nerve. I started messing up and I flubbed the last few days. And indeed, I didn't make it onto the basketball team. It was a crowning failure of my childhood. It probably changed the trajectory of my high school. I mean, I had no friends. I didn't know anyone. If I had made the basketball team, I would have had a social group. I would have had things to do. Uh, But instead, I had to go it alone. And I carried the pain of that trauma of that failure for quite a while Interestingly enough, as I've gotten older as an adult, I tell myself a much different story about that failure than I did back then. You see, I failed a lot as a kid. I had a learning disability. I didn't make the basketball team. I failed at relationships. But the thing about that is I realized I had to learn how to fail or not succeed in order to eventually succeed. And having the confidence that comes with failing often is that you realize you can't go any further down. The only way you can go is up. And so I started building off those failures and they turned into small successes and then one day large successes. And I don't think I would have ever gotten to those large successes without not making it onto that basketball team. Yeah. Help me understand how that played into the fact that later you wouldn't get into some of your top picks for college. Well, the thing about it is when you failed at a few things, it becomes natural and normal. And as opposed to being scary, think about this. When you're going for something big and audacious and you haven't succeeded or failed yet, your biggest fear is failure. So what happens when you go after these big audacious things and you fail over and over again? Well, instead of making it fearful, it actually gave me the courage to try. So Hmm. I figure why not apply to those colleges I may or may not get into? Why not stretch? The worst that can happen is I fail. And guess what? I failed before. And not only did I get past it, but I thrived. And so I took that knowledge with me. And so failure didn't become a scary thing. It became a normal part of everyday life. Interestingly enough, as I got older, I started failing less. Just at the time I had been comfortable with failing it was all of a sudden not the norm anymore. I started succeeding. And I think a big part of that was I wasn't afraid anymore. I just went at things and gave it my best. And as I got more skilled and more knowledgeable, my best actually would suffice. Whereas when I was a kid, sometimes it wouldn't. Yeah. I absolutely love that story because failure gets in the way of so many great things in life in the sense that a lot of people don't even go after the things that would truly kind of make their life their best life because they're afraid to fail. But in your case, you had failed so many times 
like almost failure proof. Like you could fail and just keep going. What I think we forget is that the line between failure and success is a continuum. And we tend to look at it as very black and white. So we either failed or we succeeded. What I've also started to learn is even as adult, when I quote unquote fail, a lot of the time something positive becomes comes out of that. And therefore, was it really a failure? No, it was somewhere that I didn't maybe reach my full goal, but it also was useful. And so, for instance, I've done lots of public speaking and my first few talks that I gave weren't the best, but those led to opportunities in which I developed my skill. I wrote about medicine from 2005 to 2016 in a blog called In My Humble Opinion, which was a precursor to writing about personal finance in my blog, Diversify. And the blog itself was a precursor to being a podcaster. And in some ways, in all those things, I incrementally both succeeded and failed because maybe I didn't reach my ultimate goals on some of these things, but good things still came out of them. And that's how I've started to look at it very differently. So even in what we call classic failure, there's often some positive that comes out of it. Yeah. I mean, if we're willing to mine the failure for the learnings and the experiential expertise that it can give us, they can literally be the best things that have ever happened to us. So I totally understand. Same thing happened to me. I actually uh, didn't get into Stanford the first time I applied and it was my biggest childhood dream. And it literally like crushed me. And my mom said to me, like, Justin, you can either let this like break you or you can let it make you. And I was like, you know, hit like a lightning bolt. And I was like, I'm going to fucking make this make me. And, <laughs> and like, I decided to take a gap yeah. year and apply again. Um, and I got in on the second try. And, you know, that was very similar. Like that made me be like, anytime I fail, it's just an opportunity to like, you know, learn, heal, grow and transform and become better. So I love that story. Yeah, I, I definitely come to the conclusion that one of the keys to happiness is the stories we choose to tell ourselves about our past. And pretty much you can see this across the board. Unhappy people tend to tell themselves stories about their lives in which bad things happened to them and life was out of control. Mm -hmm. Happy people tend to tell themselves stories about their lives that make it seem magical and triumphant. And so, and this, this doesn't matter whether actually good or bad things happen to you. Like a story that I now tell myself about my life is my father died when I was seven, suddenly from a brain aneurysm. That could have been a very sad, difficult story. But the story I tell myself is he was a doctor and I wanted to be just like him at that age. And that's what propelled me to be a doctor myself. And at the time, I had had a learning disability, so it was unclear I was even going to be able to learn how to read, much less mm. do well in high school or college or get into a medical school. So to me, that becomes a heroic story that created in me this drive and this will to do hard things, and yet this empathy for death and dying and people going through tough situations. So that's the, the story I've chosen to tell myself about what happened in my life. But I find that that leads to a lot of happiness. And so I connect that to what you're saying about Stanford. At some point, you had to tell yourself it was going to either be a poor me story or it was going to be a story of I've been pushed down, but this is my chance to get back up and show who I really am. And because you told yourself that second story, your likelihood of finding happiness, quote unquote, success, whatever we want to call this, was much increased. Yeah, I would say that defining moment in my childhood has led me to be one of the most like tenacious people I know. Like I just won't give up. It might take me forever, but I'll just keep trying until it, like until I figure it out. So I love that. Well, before we dive too deep, let me introduce you to the audience. So Jordan Grummet, aka Doc G, hospice doctor, author, podcaster, speaker. You know, a uh, champion in the financial independence community. And uh, someone who I've listened to a lot as I, you know, over my years of uh, financial independence study, um, I discovered it in 2018. You started your podcast in 2018, and I've definitely already feel like I know you, brother. So it's it truly is a pleasure to have you on the show. And I really want to, you know, go back to some of those origin stories that you you mentioned because I think they're really valuable, especially the learning disability. Because 
I actually remember now that you've brought this up. I think I also did not make my basketball team. And that kind of like was very like, you know, was a huge failure at the time. I think I was a freshman in high school and, but I ended up just playing soccer like year round. So, but the other thing that you mentioned that I actually am remembering now is I think I actually, when I was very, very young, had to be put in kind of like a special class to help me like learn better because I wasn't learning kind of at the same level as the other kids my age. And I think that was because my parents were going through a divorce at home. And so like it, you know, unfortunately really affected me. Eventually I ended up catching up, but I'm just curious, like, I want to hear your story about like, you know, what that disability was and how you kind of traversed, you know, some would say that like starting point that may not be as fortunate as, as others. I remember the day, I think I was in kindergarten and all the kids had learned how to tie their shoes and I couldn't get it. Like I couldn't figure out how to put the strings together to tie my shoes. And there was a kid designated in the class every recess who had to sit with me and tie my shoes for me before we went out. Hmm. And I remember so clearly realizing that something was wrong. When I went to learn how to read, my mom would say that I would tell her that the letters were backwards or upside down, or I had trouble physically putting the letters into space to make words. Again, this is one of those stories we tell ourselves. I could have looked at this as a very tragic thing, but instead what I see is my school system recognized it immediately. They actually provided two tutors on site at the school to work with me every week. And then my mom hired another tutor and I would go once a week to see her too. So I had three different adults whose main goal was to help me learn how to read. In fact, it was so much that they decided that during classroom time, they didn't want to stress me out by giving me extra work. So when the rest of my friends were reading and doing their exercises, they had me coloring in a coloring book. And I immediately thought something was wrong with me because why am I mm. coloring while they're all learning how to read? But actually what it was is I had these three or four people, including the principal of my school, who are all working diligently communicating and trying to help me with this learning disability. My father died, and I remember it was months after he died. I was in the midst of getting treated for this. And I think I was in first grade, or no, I was in second grade, and we had a mixed first and second grade class, and I was still coloring in my coloring book. And all the rest of the kids were in their readers, and they had like five or six different groups of reading for the first and second grade. And my teacher called me up, and I don't know why she did this, but I have a very clear memory of it. And she had me sit up in front of the room, and she put like one of the beginning first grade readers in front of me, and I was a second grader. And she asked me to read it. And I read the first page, and her eyes kind of opened up wide. And she said, oh, you didn't have much trouble with that. And then she got like the next one, and she opened it up, and I read it. And then before you know it, I was looking at the second grade readers and the kids had stopped what they were doing. And everyone was kind of staring up at me at the front of the class as I was sitting at a table doing this. And that was the day that, for whatever reason, it all clicked. And I went from coloring and coloring books to reading at a low second grade level. By the time I hit about sixth grade, I had stopped seeing the tutor and I was just about grade level. And... Also, again, the stories we tell ourselves about our past, you know, that really gave me this burning passion, maybe like when you didn't get into Stanford, as opposed to deciding I was a failure and not to go on any further, it was, oh my God, like I can be diligent, I can work hard, I can do this, and if I can overcome this, if I can go from coloring and coloring books to reading at grade level to being at the same level as my middle school friends... What can I accomplish? And so I pivoted from there. I just started working harder and harder and got smarter and smarter. And by the time I was done with high school, I was one of the top kids in the high school, one of the top 50 out of like seven, 800. But it was a process. And I'll always be thankful for having those problems as a kid because I can't imagine succeeding the way I have as an adult unless I kind of went through those original difficult times. It's the same idea with, with not making the basketball team. It's realizing you cannot be good at something, move past that, and then start 
walking yourself towards better. And so I've always done that in life. I've actually, in many ways, felt like I've started with failure, even in things that were really important for me. Name anything I've done. I can tell you of the previous iterations that didn't work, uh, but I have enough confidence from my childhood to know that when it doesn't work, you kind of learn what you need to learn from that experience and then move on and try again. And uh, that's been ultra valuable, I think, to growing up and certainly being an adult. Yeah, so totally you had a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. I'm sure that you're familiar with, I think it's Carol Dweck's work. She was actually from Stanford. Whereas, you know, you basically, you know, inhabited the definition of a growth mindset. You just knew if you worked hard enough, you could learn it and you could excel and even be like one of the top performers in your class, which you demonstrated through, you know, your ranking by the end of high school. So that's really, really powerful story because I think so many people, unfortunately, uh, especially in their younger years, they have some failures and they're just like, oh, well, I guess I'm not good at math or, you know, whatever it is. I'm just using math as a placeholder. And they just write it off and they never put in the work to be good at it. And similar to you, I never considered myself necessarily the the smartest person. I knew I was like decently intelligent, but I was willing to like work and like do the work needed to, you know, excel in whatever it was. And I, I think that's actually more important in the long run than like pure, like, you know, innate skill or talent or, you know, brilliance is like a really strong work ethic, <laughs> right? And, you know, I, I, interestingly enough, I still find myself with a fixed mindset on some things. Yeah. Like there are times when I hear myself saying, oh, you're not the kind of guy who can do this. Mm. And then I have to go back and say, well, wait, is that really true? So I don't want to pretend like it's always that way. I mean, I definitely yeah. get stuck just with the same problem everyone else does, that sometimes you tell yourself these stories that aren't true. Yeah. But I guess I have a little bit more basis now to question those stories and say, okay, well, it feels like that right now. Yeah. Uh, but what can I do to move forward and maybe change the way I feel about that? Yeah. And I would agree. I think even in, you know, my own life, as much as I'd like to be like, yes, I'm always growth <laughs> mindset. There's definitely yeah. parts. Well, like I re like I'll say things to my wife. Well, that's just the way I am. And yeah, that totally. right there is like a fixed mindset comment. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like not if your growth mindset, you know, Justin, <laughs> you would be able to, you know, transform this, uh, you know, so-called, uh, you know, poor habit that is not making my wife happy. So <laughs> I totally agree. All right. So tell us, you know, high school, you end up finishing, you know, one of the top students and then tell us like, you know, your journey into uh, college and higher education. So I went to the University of Michigan. We have a long family history. Both my mom and dad went there. My oldest brother went there. And that was a really good time for me. It was it actually being on my own I was successful at school because I had built all the good habits. I went to a really hard high school, which also helped. So by the time I got mm. to college, college wasn't nearly as challenging as high school. So I felt very confident coming in and taking classes there. But it was also a great time for me emotionally because it gave me a chance to really come to terms with my past. I would say that in early in college, I really came to terms with my father dying and what that meant. I came to terms with the fact that even though I knew how ridiculous it was when you are seven years old and your father dies... You look at things through the lens of a child, and as a child, you think everything has to do with you because you're very self-centered. So, you know, I grew up for a lot of years feeling my dad's death somehow reflected on me, that I mm. did something wrong or I wasn't good enough or I wasn't worthy enough. And so in college, it was really a time to start dealing with those issues, and I didn't specifically think about it. It was just a time of first being on my own and trying to figure out who am I, being surrounded by people I don't know trying to reinvent myself again. But unlike high school, where I kind of faced that as a freshman in high school because we moved cities, I was a lot more able. I was a lot more intelligent. I had gotten some wins behind my back. And so it was a time where I could really explore who I was and who I wanted to be. And, and I think that was really one of those times, especially with dealing with the issues about my father, that I really came to terms with the fact that no, it wasn't my fault. 
Mm. that it was a bad thing that befell me, and yet it didn't have to be a negative for my whole life, but could define me in positive ways, that I could grow and learn and become empathetic and live despite the bad things that had happened to me as opposed to fall victim to them. Yeah. I really feel a resonance with what you're saying because through reading your book and listening to some of your, you know, podcasts, like I'm aware that, you know, your drive to become a doctor was greatly influenced by your father who was a doctor. And funny enough, my drive to get to Stanford was greatly influenced by the fact that my dad went to business school there. And then my parents like, you know, separated and divorced. And, you know, my dad kind of like left the picture for a while. And I think similar to you, I kind of was, I made the decision as a very young child that like I was in order to be like worthy of like love, I'm going to be perfect and at everything and I'm going to excel at everything. And I literally just like, I was such a perfectionist as a kid because I think that was the only way I could maintain a sense of control because I feel like it was like such chaos witnessing, you know, the divorce between my parents and then kind of like my dad disappearing for a few years. And, you know, I too kind of, it was fuel for me, but definitely led to, you know, having to do some work later in life, you know, in college and, and, uh, you know, even after college. So absolutely love that story. So how did, you know, you said your dad went to university of Michigan as well. Yes, he did. Okay. So as you started to form your own identity and kind of, you know, or maybe in tandem with your father, as you went through Uh, University of Michigan. Did you go to medical school there as well, or did you go on to another school? I went to medical school at Northwestern. Interestingly enough, my father had been faculty at Northwestern, although he went to University of Michigan Medical School. So I followed in a lot of ways. I did follow his footsteps. Yeah. And then, you know, how was uh, medical school for you? Was it, you know, more challenging or easier than your undergrad I loved medical school. And, you know, it's one of those things that's so interesting is, and I've learned this about goals, sometimes our joy in the striving for a goal is a lot more than actually getting there. Um, So the process of becoming a doctor was an incredibly joyful time in my life. I was finally getting to that age where I could do what I thought I was meant to do. So I didn't find the classes more or less hard. I was really a great studier by then. And I had enough knowledge that I knew that just like everything else, if I wanted to do well in medical school, I could study, 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 and eventually I would get there. None of the negativity or burnout, I wouldn't say none of, most of the negativity or burnout that I eventually experienced in residency and practicing, I didn't feel yet as a medical student. I will tell you, though, again, another big failure in my life was I had again built myself up to this idea. I was in a pretty top medical school at Northwestern, and I wanted to do a top residency program, and I wanted to do a residency program in general internal medicine. Well, in order to do that, you have to get honors or a high grade in your internal medicine clerkship. That's during your junior year when you're finally, you're done with books, you're out taking care of patients. And you want to get honors in that clerkship, and that's like the last step to getting into a really top flight residency program, like a mass general, like a Harvard residency. And so I had started my internal medicine clerkship. I had a great team. The attending or lead physician on the team loved me. Everything was going great. Honors was in the bag. And then the week before the clerkship was over, the attending got called away because he had a sick family member. They brought in a new attending physician who was just generally not a nice person. And he said, oh, I've been looking over everything. And, you know, the most important thing of the clerkship you haven't done yet, I need to witness you doing a history and physical on a patient. And that's going to be a big part of your grade. And so this was really, really stressful. But my resident said, don't worry. I'm going to pick out a patient who's going to be perfect for you, like some bread and butter medicine, something a third-year medical student will totally be good for. I'm going to find a great patient for you. The resident went and found a great patient. He told the attending, he's like, this is the patient. Go and have Jordan interview him. And me and the attending physician went to the nursing station to go interview this patient so that the attending physician could watch me examine and interview this patient and then give me a grade. And of course, that patient was off the floor getting a medical test. 
So the attending physician looks at the nurse and says, hey, who's a good person for this medical student to see? Well, the nurse was thinking, hmm, I wonder if there's anyone with a rare disease or something that'd be really great for a medical student to see, not would this be a good person for a medical student to interview so they can look good in front of the attending physician. So he picked a demented patient with a, a rare disease that I had never heard of. And so I went and saw this patient with the attending physician. I, the, the patient had dementia, so he had trouble answering my questions, period. Then he had a disease that I literally had never heard of. It was fairly, fairly rare. And so I flubbed. I, like, totally missed. And the attending physician took me out. He said, Jordan, I'm really disappointed in you. He said, I think you did a horrible job on this. And, of course, I didn't get an honors in that rotation. I didn't get into a top residency program. And I remember... That was like the kind of beginning inkling of feeling discontent in medicine. Mm. Maybe it was this attending physician's arrogance. Maybe it was the feeling of unfairness. It wasn't what eventually led me to burnout. What led me to burnout was a whole different story of just sometimes the futility and pain of, of taking care of people in medicine. Some of it was the stress of residency and, and being on call, sometimes what felt like 24-7, and a huge part of it was all the paperwork and administrative burden that came with electronic medical records. But if I was to say, where did maybe I start feeling that first inkling of my discomfort in medicine, it was at that moment with that attending physician and just seeing my dreams yet again kind of go down the drain for a half an hour of time and just a mix-up that, you know, I had no control over. Hey there, just a few words about the incredible show sponsors for today's episode, and then we'll dig right back in. Today's show is brought to you by Veg Nutrition, Live Better. So I'm actually a veg elite athlete, and before I joined the team, I spent months doing my due diligence to make sure that the company was vision, mission, and value aligned with me, my values, my mission, my vision, and my lifestyle. I got to know the owners super well. I even got to know the person who formulates all the products, and they passed with flying colors. So I couldn't be more excited to represent a company that I feel so aligned with. And I want to tell you about two of my favorite products. The first is the Veg Pre-Workout. So when I first went vegan or mostly vegan, the last thing for me to go fully vegan was finding a vegan pre-workout that gave me the focus, the energy, and the power that I was looking for. And I can tell you, this is the best pre-workout that I've ever had. It gives me incredible focus and energy. And what's probably the best is it leaves me with no crash after I take it, which is great. And the flavors are so freaking good. There's literally peach mango and a Patriot Pop that tastes like, you know, the firecracker popsicles, cherry lemon lime flavor. They're literally so good that I can dry scoop them. And they just released a watermelon flavor for just in time for summer, and it's incredible. So that's the first product. The second product is arguably also my favorite, and that's the plant protein. Comes in three incredible flavors, chocolate peanut butter, vanilla ice cream, and cold brew coffee. Yep, you heard me. Cold brew coffee flavor. It tastes incredible, all three flavors. 25 grams of protein, fully organic, incredible ingredients, heavy metal tested, and it is my go-to post-workout. Make sure that I'm recovering and refueling and giving my muscles the protein that they need to rebuild for that next workout. So go to vegnutrition.com slash dragon and try their full line of supplements and you'll get 15% off. Or you can just use Dragon at checkout, and you'll get 15% off. So that's vegnutrition.com slash dragon to get 15% off. Veg Nutrition, live better. Are you able to recall kind of the 
mental conversation that you had with yourself in order to kind of like move through that versus just like lament and, you know, continue to flounder in, in such a big failure? So I was devastated. There's no question about it. And I loved reading classic books. And I remember sometime in high school, no, probably in college or early in medical school, I read a book called The Glass Bead Game by Herman Hesse. Now, Herman Hesse had written like Siddhartha, and he's very well known for Endymion, a, great, a bunch of great books. The Glass Bead Game was, I think, one of his less acknowledged books. But there was a story within that. I don't even remember the plot of the Glass Bead Game itself. But there's a point in the book where the main character is telling a story. And it's, I think, probably a Buddhist story, right? So the idea is there is this young man who falls in love with this young woman, but he was only able to marry her if he made her dead happy. And it gets into this very complicated story of all these things he needed to do unless life was perfect. He tries to do what he's supposed to. He ends up failing. He ends up breaking some rules. The policemen of the time come after him. He ends up hiding out in the forest. His life is ruined. Everything is horrible. And he wanders in the forest for days and days and days and comes to a small hut. And in front of the hut is a yogi who's sitting there meditating. And this main character is at his last. He's, his whole life has gone horrible. Everything is terrible. He just wants to pack it in and quit. And he sees this calm, peaceful yogi and he knows immediately he wants whatever this yogi has. So day after day, he comes back to the yogi and he begs him, teach me what you know, you know, help me feel the peace that you're feeling. And the yogi eventually relents and he says, you know what? I'm going to head, I'm going to go ahead and make you my student. But before I do here, take this picture, go to the stream and fill it with water. So the guy grabs the pitcher. He goes to the stream to fill it with water. And lo and behold, as he's at the stream, up walks the girl he fell in love with. And she says, we've been looking for you for weeks. We've realized that you were right the whole time. My dad wants you to marry me, come back, run the estate. He sees that life all of a sudden has changed. Everything he wanted is right there in front of him. He throws the pitcher down. He goes with the woman. He goes back. He takes over the estate. He becomes the most rich and powerful person in the area. He eventually becomes ruler of his small area. He has a beautiful son. He has all the riches he could want. And then someone from a neighboring province brings an army and starts attacking his province because he has too much and they want everything he has. And he ends up hiding in the castle with his wife and his child. And this neighboring army takes everything and they come in into the castle and they take his wife and child away. And he knows it's sudden death for all of them. And he sees that his life is unraveling and they take him to the torture chamber and they're about to start working on him. And then he wakes up and he's back there at the stream with his jug. And he realizes how complicated and conflated his life had became. And all those things he thought he wanted actually met, led to sadness and discomfort and actually didn't get him where he wanted to go. So he goes back, takes the picture to the yogi, and ends up spending the rest of his life there learning how to meditate and be calm and peaceful. And I think of that story a lot because it, to me, helped me put in perspective what I thought was important versus reality. So I could look at this moment where I failed miserably, where all of a sudden I wasn't going to get honors in my medicine rotation, where I wasn't going to go to the residency of my dreams, and I could have looked at that moment and said, this is the beginning of the unraveling of my life. Or I could also look at it as a gift and realize that there are many pathways in life, and that means many opportunities. And just because the pathway you feel so connected to for whatever self-serving reason you think is going to be the right path, 
that maybe there are other alternate paths and those paths can also lead to as much happiness or maybe even more happiness. And so that, that was a story that I kind of told myself and I said, well, maybe there's some hidden truth and some gems here that maybe the path less taken might actually end up being the right path for me. And in many ways it was because it never did hinder me. So I got a second tier residency instead of a first tier residency. And I ended up becoming a doctor and helping people. And then eventually I found that medicine wasn't serving me, but then learned about personal finance and started public speaking and writing a blog and podcasting and found that I could find a way to manifest the important goodness of what I thought was inside of me in any of these paths. Yeah. And that I didn't, I didn't have to get all stuck up on this one path that I thought held everything exactly the way I wanted it. It didn't have to be the only way. And in fact, maybe that was the worst path in the end. Maybe I would have gone to a top residency and had other issues or problems that I couldn't have foreseen. Yeah. So how long were you a doctor before you, A, recognized that you preferred kind of hospice work over the more traditional, you know, doctoring work that you were doing prior? And then also kind of like where in your medical career did you discover like financial independence? I always tell people like this, the real seeds of burnout started when I was a second year resident and I was taking care of patients in an ICU and I had a patient die unexpectedly and it was very painful. And I was the only one in the ICU. It was the middle of the night and the patient's family had come and I had sat them down by myself at three in the morning in the conference room and let them know their family member had died and answered all their questions. And the next morning when I was rounding, after not sleeping for whatever, 30, 35 hours, I was continuing to take care of patients the next day as we did normally in residency. And I started getting phone calls from the patient's daughters. I guess the family I had informed was his new family, but he had three daughters from a previous marriage and none of them had known he had died. And I had to tell them over the phone because none of them were local. I had to tell them over the phone that their father died. And it was this horrendous situation. It was just heartbreaking. And I felt so responsible and felt so bad. And at that moment, I realized I was standing a little bit on a precipice that I could either move forward and submerge all these bad feelings and go about my business and do my job and continue my training, or I could kind of fall off the cliff and wallow and feel bad. And so what I did is I built these walls to protect myself, right? Not just from falling off the cliff, but actually from letting emotion in and out. And that was like the beginning of burnout. It was emotionally closing myself off to the point where I could function after no sleep, after 36 hours, and make the most difficult decisions, life-changing decisions for my patients without ever looking back, whether good or bad things happened. And that was kind of that moment where... I lost that piece of empathy and softness that maybe drove me into medicine in the first place because my father had died. And that was how I began my burnout journey. It got worse when I finished residency and started practicing. I found that often my patients weren't happy, that there was way too much work to be done, that there was more paperwork and computer work, and I was spending less and less time talking to patients, that I was stressed out continuously about being sued for things I might be able to control but probably couldn't. And at that point, after practicing five or six years, years after I had experienced that thing in residency, I started talking to myself about what is my way out? How am I going to deal with this when it gets too much? And that's when I started looking at my finances. And I was lucky enough that I was born to parents who modeled great financial behavior. So by the time I was five or six years out of medical school, I had investments, I owned property, I was doing all the right things, but I just didn't understand what that was. It was about 2014, after years of getting by, saving money, trying to save for a future, but not knowing exactly how to do that correctly, that Jim Dolly, the White Coat Investor, had sent me his book to review for my medical blog. This was in 2014. His book, The White Coat Investor, talks about physician finances, but also talks about things like financial independence. And his book actually was what gave me the vocabulary to truly understand what managing my finances meant. And all of a sudden, I had an escape. And it was 2014, and I had to look at my job as a doctor and decide what is worthwhile, what isn't worthwhile. Should I leave it completely? Because I knew all of a sudden 
I've actually have enough money. It's invested wisely. I could step away from medicine immediately. But the problem was I hadn't done any of the identity work. I didn't know what my true purpose was in life. I thought my purpose was being a doctor and that was my identity. Once I decided that, hey, I now have enough money to step away from this thing that's physically hurting me. It's giving me burnout. But then I also didn't know what I was stepping into. Who was I going to be? What did purpose look like in my life? How was I going to live the rest of my years if I stepped away from medicine? And it took a bunch more years after that to actually start taking action. So how did you start to explore what your true purpose was? So you kind of realize like, oh, my purpose is not medicine. That's my identity. What's my purpose? Like, help me understand how you went through that process of uncovering your purpose. So I did a few things. One is I made my life easier. So I knew I had enough money after I read Jim Daly's book. I knew basically I was financially independent. I wasn't ready to leave the identity of being a physician totally, but I knew there were parts of my job I didn't like. There was friction there. So the first thing I did is started subtracting things out of my job that I didn't need because I had enough money. So I didn't want to quit medicine totally because I wasn't ready to make that emotional jump. But I knew I didn't need to be on call all the time. I knew I didn't have to have my own practice where people were depending on me. I knew that I could get rid of nights and weekends. And so I just started getting rid of things out of my job, cleaving it down, getting rid of all the friction until doing only what I wanted to be doing. Over years, that turned into just doing hospice because hospice was the piece of medicine that even if I wasn't being paid for it, I'd still want to do it. I knew that that was a big part of the identity I wanted to keep, the part of being a doctor I still liked. But even that, I started doing it only a certain number of hours a week. And at some point, I got to the point where I was only working 10 to 15 hours a week as a consultant. And that was perfect for me. So the first thing I had to do was just get rid of friction in my life, get rid of time commitments, get rid of things that weren't serving me. But that opened up a huge amount of time and space in my life. I was lucky enough to realize that there were these things that I loved doing all throughout my life, but I always put them off because I told myself, you can't do that for a living or you can't make money doing that or that's a hobby. And so public speaking was one, writing was another. I knew I loved to have these deep conversations. I now identify more as a communicator than a physician, but I knew I loved communicating in its various forms and I had always done it on some level. I had written a medical blog for years, but I always had to squeeze it into little time periods when I gave myself permission to do it. So now that I was creating much more time and space in my life by only working as a doctor 15 hours a week and only doing hospice, I had all this time and emotional space to start looking at these things that I'd always been putting off and saying, okay, now you have the time. What does it look like to do these things in a meaningful way? And that's how I started building an alternate life and I, a life that now I feel fits me so much better than the life of being a physician and really gave myself a chance to grow into it. So that looked like blogging, it looked like public speaking, eventually it looked like podcasting. And that was the evolution that wrote, that led to me writing Taking Stock, was it was this natural evolution of taking those things that were important to me and having them become a bigger and bigger part of my life. I love that. So question for you, through your writing and speaking, was that part of your process of kind of, metabolizing your life and starting to understand who you truly were and what your true purpose was like as a communicator, like as you did the work of a communicator, did it help you really kind of like process all that you had been through and who you really were underneath kind of all the uh, societal names you had been given? Oh, there's no question about it. I started writing my blog, Diversify, and I actually started writing every single day. I would publish something every single day, and I did that for almost a year. And what that became was my online diary or almost an accountability journal in which I could work through all of these issues. I could talk about what is financial independence? What is enough? What does enough look like in our life? What is the role of work? Should we have jobs? Should we work after we have enough money? What type of work should we do? I started creating a series of litmus tests for me to understand what I wanted out of the future. And I don't know if I could have done that unless I had written. You know, one of the great things about writing in public is it did become, in a sense, my accountability. I had been writing about these things for days and then weeks and then months. And it gave me that extra push to actually carry them out and follow through. Yeah. I love that. 
I kind of went through a similar thing. So I wrote a ton, but I didn't publish a ton. But just through the writing, even unpublished works, it helped me really like process, you know, what was going on in my life, who I currently was, who I wanted to be, who I felt like I, I wanted to become. And that is such a transformational process that, you know, I remember, you know, thinking like, ah, like, you know, I'm not that great of a blogger and kind of like a shame that I never really like made it as a blogger. But that's what like led me to, you know, other forms of kind of artistic expression that I feel like I found a lot more success in, you know, like Instagram and then ultimately now podcasting like if i had never blogged i don't think i ever would have got to like instagram and podcasting and so i love that you know you basically were <laughs> doing this public online diary and accountability log and and really exploring these things so i'm curious you mentioned like what is enough have you defined that for yourself oh for sure i think I've spent a lot, a lot of time thinking about what is enough. And originally what enough was, was a net worth number, right? It was mm -hmm. having enough money so I can support myself. I've evolved quite a bit and realized that money doesn't necessarily make me happy. It acts as a tool to help me do other things that do make me happy or content. But then I had to question my, start asking the question, well, what does enough really look like in your life? And to me, I mean, I think that's a proxy for what does happiness look like in your life, mm -hmm. right? Because enough just means that you're feeling content and safe and fulfilled. And so what happiness looks in my life, I really have two different definitions. One is one I've given you already. Happiness looks to me like telling myself the stories about my past that make it feel magical. So that's part of happiness. The other part of happiness, and this gets more to enough, is Creating a sense of what I call climbs. What a climb is, is it's doing something that's purposeful for you in life, that you enjoy the process even more than you enjoy the goal or the product that comes out of that process. So a good example for me is podcasting. I love podcasting. When I get in front of a mic, you put a mic in front of my face and I get prepared to have a conversation, it lights me up. And I know that that next hour or two, whatever I'm doing, I'm going to thoroughly enjoy it. And in a sense, for me, that's enough. Like, I can't control what that podcast does after I'm done doing that interview. I can't control if it gets a million downloads or five downloads. I, of course, love this goal of getting a million downloads, let's say, a month. That sounds really amazing. But you know what? That's a goal that I only can do so much to affect, right? I can do social media. I can, you know, create as good of a podcast as I can. I can do all these things, but whether I get to a million or not, God knows. So a climb is something in which the goal itself doesn't matter nearly as much as the enjoyment of the process. But I would add on to that. I think a really good climb, you also feel like you're making incremental progress. So I can't control whether I get a million downloads a month or not, but I probably can increase my downloads by 100 every month or 50 every month. And that's something that I probably can change by doing a little extra social media or by really honing my skills and becoming a better interviewer. So that's how I see enough. Enough is finding a sense of purpose in doing something you enjoy doing it where the process is enough and that you do have some goal in which you can make some very small incremental gain. And I think that's what enough or, like I said, the proxy is happiness looks like. Yeah. This is such a rad definition. Like, seriously. So a couple comments. One of my favorite words in, in actual personal values is, is magic or magical because mm -hmm. I want to live a life where it literally feels magical. Mm -hmm. That is so incredibly important to me. And like, if I could choose like a, a word that I want to describe my life, it's magical. Cause like, you know, when you watch an epic movie and it's just like, oh my God, that's so magical. Like what they're going through, you know, their, you know, superpowers and the struggles that they have to go through. And then the fact that you've illustrated out this framework or idea of the climb is so powerful because I've recognized in my own life you know, similar to what you recognize, it's like the striving is almost better than like actually reaching the thing. It's like the day-to-day -day like process 
much of which is very repetitive, right? And for me, the way I'm kind of thinking about this right now is like the climb to financial independence was like one of those climbs. Um, yeah, and totally. then I like I got there and then it's like, OK, what's the next climb? Right. And then now, similar to you, for me, it's like uh, podcasting is another climb. And I'm like, you know, I don't have a huge podcast or anything yet, but I just love it so much. And just knowing that I'm be getting better by like just doing it yeah. as often as possible. And then the climb of preparing just to do a podcast is so enjoyable, like researching a person and all their work and then like pulling out the stuff that is exciting and interesting to me so that I can talk to them about it, like really like dig deep into them. That climb is so incredibly enjoyable. And then, you know, another relation for me is like fitness. Like, you know, I, I tend to work out six to seven days a week and it's just like the perpetual climb. Like I'll achieve one fitness goal and then it's like, okay, what's the next fitness goal? Cause, and it's like momentary. It's like, oh, cool. I, I'm now able to do X, Y, Z or achieve this kind of like, you know, strength or, or this, this aesthetic look. And, but then it's like immediately what's the next climb. And I, I love that we're drawing that out for the audience because there is a saying that oh, I'm trying to remember the saying. It's something that Tony says, oh, um, progress is one of the only things that makes humans happy yeah and that's what the climb is and and what you said about incremental gain or progress um and that was a, a quote from T tony robbins who i've been like a fan of uh for a long time is like progress is what makes us happy it's not the achieving of the goal so this is really awesome I want to dive back uh, a little bit back into the art of subtraction which is in your book Taking Stock, A Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life. Because similar to you, I've found infinite more happiness in my own life when I started to remove the pieces of work, but also like the uh, the home life work. Mm -hmm. And like the more of that I remove off my plate, the more magical my life becomes because then I can purely focus on the climbs that are important to me. So walk us through the art of subtraction. You know, you did it somewhat in the professional sense, but maybe dive a little bit deeper into that and then also walk us through kind of like the homework life, like what the the work that we have to do in our domestic life. So let me put this in terms of time, because I think this is what we totally get wrong about life is we often think that we can buy or sell time. We can use time. Time is this commodity that we can exchange things for. And the truth of the matter is nothing could be further from the truth. Time is stable and it passes no matter what you do. So the truth of the matter is we get a set amount of time in life and it passes and you can't do anything about it. Everyone has a different set amount of time, right? Because who knows how long we're going to live. We have no control over that. We have no control over time. We have no control over time passing. The only thing we have a modicum of control over is this idea that we can choose to put different activities into the time slots that make up our life, right? So if you call a time slot a day, a month, a week, a year, it doesn't matter what you call it. But the point is there are these discrete time slots. And on some level, we have some choice about what we choose to put in those time slots, what activities we choose to do during those time slots as time passes. So the goal in life, in my opinion, is to develop a sense of purpose and then fill up as many of those time slots with things that are purposeful to you with these climbs. And then conversely, to take all those things you don't like doing, to take all those things that don't feel purposeful and subtracting them out of those time slots. So how can we do that? And we can look at this in lots of different ways. We're talking about professionally, but we're also talking about personally. When we're talking about professionally, the question is, how can we take whatever we think of as a quote unquote job and fill it with activities that feel meaningful and purposeful to us and get rid of all the things we don't like about it? Now, if you're financially independent, like I was when I developed some of these ideas, it's much easier, right? Because I had enough money. So I could ultimately look at my job and start subtracting out nights and weekends. And I didn't like having my own practice. So I got rid of that, et cetera. 
So for me, it was fairly easy to start getting rid of things that cause friction in my life and removing those things from my time from my time slots and then putting in things I like to doing. So professionally, that was hospice work. But since I got rid of everything else, I had all this extra time to then start doing public speaking and writing and podcasting and writing a book. So it was all a substitution. It was subtracting out the bad and adding in the good and trying to fill as many of those time slots as possible with things I wanted to do. Now, I came from a very privileged place of already being financially independent when I discovered this. But even for people who are not financially independent, even for people who are in their 20s and are working a nine to five and they don't like their job, you can start doing things at other times in life, right? You're young, you have tools other than money, like free time and energy and maybe the lack of a spouse or kids. Maybe you can spend your weekends doing a side hustle, something that's purposeful for you, and maybe you can create a little money doing that. And then all of a sudden you can get rid of some of that nine to five, which you don't like. So you're substituting out doing work you don't like for work you do like by creating a side hustle and maybe covering one day a week of your salary so that you can work less at the nine to five and more at the side hustle, which you developed as something that was purposeful for you. So again, we're really, all we're talking about is trying to substitute in different activities during those time slots, subtracting out the bad and adding out the things that are purposeful. That's our professional life. It works the same way in your personal life. Like I like to be a doctor more than I like cleaning toilets. Even on its worst day, I enjoy being a doctor more than I like cleaning my bathroom. So for me, I could spend more time being a doctor and subtract out doing homework at the house because I was making money being a doctor. So that was a conscious decision. And I think we have to look at life a lot in these conscious decisions. Nothing drives me crazy more than someone who got rid of a job that they didn't love but they didn't hate by getting to financial independence But they were so tight on the numbers that once they retired, they had to spend all their time cleaning their toilets and doing the lawn and all the things they used to hire out because they hated doing them. But they used to have money when they worked at their job that was mediocre, but not wonderful. But now that they quit their job, they're now doing things that they don't like doing because they no longer have the money from their mediocre job. And in my opinion, you might as well have done the mediocre job because you like that a heck of a lot more than you like, for instance, cutting your own lawn. For everyone, it's going to be a different calculus, right? It's a different equation. But the point are, these are decisions we can make about how we fill our time and what resources we have. Money is like potential energy. When we do things that make money, it allows us to spend that money to not have to do other things. Sometimes it's to buy things, but often it's to hire someone else to do things we don't want to do. And I think that's a reasonable trade-off. And it's all based on this idea of the art of subtracting in which you don't subtracting out which you don't like and adding in which the things that are purposeful to you or feel like a climb. And I just want people to maximize that equation so they're spending as much of their time doing things they like to do and as little of the time doing things they don't like to do. Yeah. I'm not even sure which part to uh, <laughs> cut, cut into there cuz there's so much good good stuff there. So a couple things for the audience cuz I really want to empower people. You don't have to like quit your job to go find your passion or your purpose, you can actually start to work towards it while you're at a mediocre job. So I've actually always loved my job. Like I'm in, you know, uh, B2B technology sales for a Stanford startup that I'm part of the founding team. So like, you know, I feel very connected to my company because I've been, uh, you know, employee number four up to, you know, nine years later. And, uh, but there's plenty of work within, you know, the company that I don't want to do. And fortunately, um, I have strategically kept myself in a position where I could continue to just do the work that I loved, which is essentially meeting with clients and presenting or pitching to them the vision of the company, the mission, the values and the service that we can provide and kind of like basically bringing that those ideas, like animating those ideas in front of a person. Like I'm very much a performer. Like I just like, for me, like any presentation is like a stage that I can perform on. So as I was doing that, I started to do kind of like inspirational, like, you know, one minute or 30 second, like motivational talks on my Instagram every morning. And I would basically just like teach different principles of like, you know, personal development, mindset, fitness, et cetera. 
And I did this for years, also while I was blogging, also while I was building presentations for my sales job. And then on top of that, I started a money mastermind meetup group, you know, in the Stanford area that, you know, people from all over the Bay would come in per person. Then COVID hit and we took it virtual. So for literally a year and a half, I was leading these money masterminds, like kind of like group mastermind sessions. Can, and then all my meetings that used to be in person at these companies moved to virtual meetings. And then all this time I spent building presentations for all these like pitches. I then six months ago launched a fitness and money coaching program online, utilizing those motivational, inspirational, educational Instagram talks that I did, the presentation building uh, managing like large groups of people online in mastermind groups. And now I have a side hustle that is like even like it's doing even more of the purposeful work that I absolutely love to do while I continue to do the work at my, my corporate company garden, like, and like, I'm not leaving there cause I love that work too. And then, uh, you know, now I also uh, do the podcasting. And so it's all played together. And I didn't have to leave Garton to go pursue these other things. I did them like slowly on the side. And over, you know, years, they I developed the skill set and then was able to launch them. So I really want to encourage the audience, like, there's almost always something you really love at like work. Because that's probably why they're paying you or the main reason they're paying you. Like for you, like you really love the hospice. And, you know, I love that, like finding the hospice work for you was like returning to your heart, right? Because you were like really shutting yourself down and, you know, probably, I mean, very like robotical and just like closing yourself off and like why you shut your heart down and you're like dying, but then you realize in hospice, you're able to actually open your heart and it brought you back to life in that career, correct? Yeah. And let me let me add to that, the idea that, you know, subtraction doesn't only come from privilege or to people who already have money. I give an example of my book of a retired teacher who I took care of with emphysema. He found himself in a position where he was a math teacher. And the way they teach math has changed quite a bit over the last decade in middle school and high school. And he started to hate teaching math, something he had done all his life. The problem was he couldn't leave his job. He needed his pension. He needed a few more years of work. It was too soon and he didn't have enough money. Most of us would say, okay, just keep doing what you're doing and take it as a loss. But he used the art of subtraction in a different way he actually went to the school and found that they needed a new college advisor. And it was something that he was interested in, able to do. And they also needed a new soccer coach, something which he loved. So he was able to get rid of teaching math. He became a college advisor and helped teach the soccer team. And he's really started enjoying his last few years. In fact, he stayed on a few extra years after his pension had vested because he really liked what he would do. And you know, he eventually got emphysema, he had oxygen, but he would still show up to the soccer games way after he had retired uh, with his oxygen, his oxygen tank to watch his home team play. So like subtraction isn't something we only do once we're financially independent. I would argue it's something that we should have an eye on from the beginning of our careers. Yeah. I mean, I just have to make comment on that the housekeeping work. Uh, a few months ago, I don't know, maybe a year ago, my wife and I finally started investing in having like a housekeeper come. And I say investment because it literally <laughs> is an investment in our marriage. Because I'll be honest, I I did minimal to no housework, and my wife did all of it or ninety eight percent of it, and it made her miserable which then affected our relationship because, you know, I was like, just make an excuse like, oh, I have to go do work or I need to focus on work. And then we ended up just getting like a housekeeper. And that was like one of the best investments that we've ever made. And a more recent one for us is, you know, we strategically stayed in a, a home that was, uh, it wasn't the nicest home. It was definitely one of the least nicest homes in our neighborhood. So it wasn't like anything we were, even though like 
like, you know, earned a sizable income. We were like, you know, really focused on rocketing ourselves to FI. But then we got to a point where we were financially independent and we could actually upgrade into a much nicer home, a rental home that is like really beautiful, like something that like picturesque. And we purposely chose not to buy, but to rent. So A, we could stay financially independent and B, so we could ensure that like, hey, is this really the area that we want to live long term? And we've been here uh, since September. So about, you know, almost three months now. And it's just like totally expanded our happiness in our life because like now we live in a beautiful home, but we're not like worried about money, right? We didn't mm-hmm. sacrifice our kind of uh, financial freedom to live in a beautiful home. Like we're like doing it step by step Why we're really focusing on uh, maintaining financial freedom, having as much fun as possible, but then like, you know, ensuring that like the way that we're utilizing our money is actually making our life more fun, more free, like, more beautiful, you know, happier and healthier. And since we've been here, we haven't got a new housekeeper. So this, this like my wife, like literally right before the podcast is like cleaning the kitchen. And I'm like, we got to get a housekeeper. Cause I like, I see her face and she's like lovingly do it, but I know she doesn't want to be doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's how do you want to spend your time? Yeah. Cause if you're not using your money to fill those time slots with purposeful things, then you're not using your money correctly. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really challenging for people in the financial independence community because there's like such a emphasis on like frugality, like with everything at all times. And, you know, I think that is a critical part of the beginning part of the FI journey. But then there's this like, I don't know, like I when I was talking to Brad Bear, I called it the frugality to abundance crossover point. Where you realize like, wait, I'm so abundant now that that like I don't need to be ultra frugal in every area of my life. I can actually start to use my abundance to, you know, create more fun and freedom in my life. And so I've been trying to understand like, like, A, like how do you empower people to like start to make that transition? Because I know people that like are very much like financially independent. But they're still so frugal to the point I'm just like, you are wasting your time and energy. Any thoughts there? Yeah, I think there's a simple answer. I mean, I think we define financial independence wrong. I think we define financial independence by money or some net worth number. Mm. And I think that's our first mistake. And what I've argued in taking stock is we really have to start with purpose, identity, and connections. And only once we get those in hand can then we decide what to do with our money and what financial independence looks like. In my opinion, financial independence is having the ability to fill as many of those time slots as possible with meaningful, purposeful climbs. So if your meaningful, purposeful climb is your job and your job pays your monthly needs, guess what? You're financially independent from the moment you start that job. Yeah. And I think this is where we make the mistake. Money is a tool and it's a tool that we use to do other more important things. The problem is most of the financial independence community and people in general feel like money is the goal. Mm. And so what happens when you have enough money and money is the goal? You just set a higher goal. <laughs> Why be more fr- or or you get freaked out that you're going to lose the money because loss aversion, we fear losing something we have doubly how much we fear of never getting there. So it's not a great goal. And if you focus it on it is the primary goal, you're going to live a frugal life regardless of how much money you have. But if we start making the goal those climbs, we then just see money as a tool. And then it becomes, what is the necessary amount of money I can use as a tool to get to these climbs, to live the life I want to live, and to do it for the longest period possible? And when you start looking at it like that, then you can toggle like part of the climb might be taking expensive vacations and paying for really nice amenities, but that can be worked into your plan. If that's really part of your climb, then money is the tool that helps you get there. And you can start realistically looking at how much money you need. Whereas maybe for you, the climb is podcasting like it is for me and you. And guess what? Podcasting costs almost nothing. Yeah. So I don't need nearly as much money to support myself if podcasting is the climb or or one of my many climbs that's important to me, I can be frugal 
in order to support that climb. But being frugal for a reason, not yeah. being frugal just to be frugal. And yeah. I guess that's my point. Hey there, just a few words about the incredible show sponsors for today's episode, and then we'll dig right back in. This show is brought to you by Feel Free from Botanic Tonics. This product is unlike anything I've ever had before. No joke. It's made with kava root and other ancient plants, and just half a shot gives me this incredible sense of focused flow and productivity. And I love to take just half a shot right before I work out. I take it with my pre-workout and it takes my workouts to the next level. It is seriously unlike anything I've ever had. It's also an incredible productivity tool for any big work projects that you have or long periods of time where you just need to be super focused in flow state and get a lot of shit done. So if you want to give this a shot, you can go to botanictonics.com and use code DRAGON at checkout to get 40% off your first order. No joke, 40% off with code DRAGON. That's feel free from botanictonics.com, code DRAGON. Feel free, feel good. Yeah, it's like I'm being frugal by not purchasing a home in the Bay Area because that would like then all my money would be tied up in a home and then I would be freaked out that I have to earn a certain amount of money every year in order to, you know, like make enough money to, I don't know, like get back to some like financial independence number. Whereas by like just waiting uh, on purchasing the home and living in a home that we're really happy in, I stay free and I'm able to pursue these things like podcasting and, you know, building a, a coaching program. And I don't have to worry if they make money. Mm -hmm. Like I can just do them because they're, they're full of purpose for me. So if it takes me 10 years for, to get them super profitable, I don't care because it's the climb that I care about. Right. So to put it in other words, you've used the art of subtracting to subtract out the house because it's something that actually was causing you more friction in your life than benefit. And the substitute is you now have a lot more space and money as a tool to pursue the climbs or the things that are purposeful in your life. So you have done exactly what I'm talking about. You've taken those limited amount of time slots in your life and you've gotten rid of friction in them and then you've replaced them with those climbs. That's what we should be doing all of our lives, whether we're talking about professionally or personally. That's what happiness is. There you yeah. go. That's happiness. Yeah. No, literally I had a few, like a month ago, like I, I almost broke down and quit like one of my job, like my job at Garden because I was like so stressed out that I had to make enough money to purchase a home in the Bay Area, which means like if I want to live in the kind of home that I want to li live in, I need to not just be a multimillionaire, which I already am. I need to become a decamillionaire in yeah. order to buy that home and still be financially independent, which means I need to earn more this year, this month. And then I like had this conversation with my wife. I'm like, hey, what if it like we like just continue to rent until like we really feel like we want to buy and we like remove this like Const, like idea that we have to get the home in the next year or two because like I'm so stressed out I'm not enjoying life anymore and she was like yeah that's totally fine and I I would think I was just internally putting the pressure on myself that time pressure we release that time pressure and like suddenly I'm super happy and life is magical again yeah yeah I mean it makes sense when we start being consistent when we start living a life that helps us pursue our purpose as opposed to just pursuing a net worth or a money number, it feels better. It feels less stressful. We actually realize that some of our goals, some of our dreams, some of the things that make us tick are actually reachable. Yeah. And that maybe some of these ideas about what we're supposed to want or what's supposed to be important are actually getting in the way of everything else. Yeah. Yeah. In the book, you talk about spending on joy and necessity versus fear. And I think that's that's such a good lesson because, you know, that's, that's the kind of stuff that, like, the more you spend on joy and, like, 
the the necessities then the more magical your life actually becomes because if you're literally just spending out of fear or you know keeping up with the joneses you know what i mean because a lot of my friends own homes in the bay area but like Mm. they're not financially independent like you know what i mean (laughs) so they're like pretty stressed with work and uh you know it's 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 making you know it's making a toll on them so i want to talk a little bit more about your book um there's kind of two things that stick out for me one is i haven't spoke about the different speeds of phi on my podcast yet and for my audience i kind of you know i think to start like you know we kind of define what like financial independence is to you but like traditional financial independence to like most people is like you know your assets generate enough income to cover your cost of living can you walk me through the different speeds of phi and kind of like illustrate that for the audience so they can understand that like you don't have to race towards phi there's like different ways for you to like go after financial independence Yeah. So in the book, I talk about the parable of the three brothers. This is the idea that there are really three approaches to financial independence and they're different speeds and they really define financial independence in different ways. The first, what I call the path of the eldest brother is that typical financial independence retire early pathway. This is the idea that we're going to grind it out, work really hard, especially in the first 10, 15 years of work, get to a large net worth number that we're going to invest And once we hit that net worth number, some people call it 25 times your yearly spending. Some people talk about something called the safe withdrawal rate of 4%, where you're spending 4% of invested assets. We get to that point, we declare ourselves financially independent, and we retire early, and we're set. The idea here is in those first 10 to 15 years, you are grinding it out. You're front-loading the sacrifice. Maybe you're not living as much of a purposeful life, right? Maybe you're not pursuing your climbs as much. You're willing to put that off. Because you know at some point you'll hit this retirement place and then you can live a life full of those climbs and do whatever you want. That's kind of that traditional financial independence pathway. It's probably the fastest way to get to the end of your career, but it's not necessarily the fastest way to financial independence. If you want to get to financial independence faster, there's some other ways. There's what I call the path of the middle brother. This is the path of passive income or side hustles. Instead of financial independence being defined as a certain net worth number, instead financial independence is being defined by having enough passive or side hustle income to cover your monthly needs. So a lot of people like this pathway because they don't want to wait to live a life of purpose, identity, and connections for 10 or 15 years. On the other hand, they do want to front load the sacrifice a little bit to get some revenue streams going in. So if you think about it, a lot of people can create passive income or side hustle income. And after a year or two or maybe three, you can get enough to cover your monthly needs. You can then call yourself financially independent. It's a much faster way than the 10 to 15 years it might take you to do kind of the path of the eldest brother. And so after those two to three years, you can really start incorporating those climbs or purpose and identity into your daily life. In fact, if you're lucky enough, you can find side hustles or passive income that also feel very purposeful for you. So This is a great path. It's a faster path to financial independence, but you're going to be working longer, right? The eldest brother retires after 10 or 15 years. A middle brother has to maintain that passive income and those side hustles, maybe into their 60s and 70s, depending on if they create some extra to put in the stock market. But there's some people who even don't want to wait till tomorrow to start pursuing those climbs now and living a life of purpose. For those people, they may take the path of the youngest brother what I call the passion play. This is the idea that if you can find a job that you love, a job that you do even if you weren't being paid for it, and that job happens to cover your monthly needs, you're basically financially independent from day one. It's a great path for like architects and artists and people who really are creatives. The problem with that path is, you know, you might not be able to find a passion that you can do that'll actually cover your monthly needs. It also might be a very long path, right? So if you're just making enough money to cover your monthly needs, you may have to work into your 60 or 70 or longer to kind of cover for retirement, especially if you're not putting a lot extra away. So those are kind of the three different paths. The eldest brother, which is traditional fire, front-loading the sacrifice. The middle brother, which is passive income or side hustles, which cover your monthly needs. Or the last is more of a passion play, which is finding a job that you really love a job that's the climb for you. And once you make enough money doing that to cover what you need to pay all your bills, you're set. 
So it's financial independence at three different speeds and in three different ways. What I think, again, people forget is the whole purpose of financial independence is to live a life of meaning to pursue those climbs. So you can pick whichever path works for you, whichever feels like it'll allow you to do the things you want in life. In other words, getting back to my old analogy, whatever allows you to fill as many of those time slots as possible with things that are purposeful, if you keep that in mind, you can then pursue that framework for financial independence and how you want to get there. And it's just notable that you don't have to stick to one path all the time. So in many ways, I started out as an eldest brother front-loading the sacrifice so I could make a lot of money as a physician. But then I went into hospice and hospice was very passionate for me. And I kind of changed in some ways to a youngest brother because I was really passionate about continuing to do the hospice work. But then I also did some side hustles and some other things on the side. And so in a lot of ways, I also became a middle brother. So the point is you don't have to be one all the time. But you do have to be thoughtful and intentional about how you build a final financial framework around those things that are important to you. Yeah, absolutely love this framework because the whole mission of Alchemize Life podcast is to empower people to proactively design and truly live a life worth living. Yeah. And there's so many different ways to do it. And you can you literally like you did. And actually what I did too is you can utilize all three strategies. And totally. you can pull those different levers at different times as it makes sense to pull them. So I think uh, I really enjoyed your book. I do want to talk a little bit about like death and dying and, and kind of like regrets and a regret free life, because like you're a very special person in the sense that you've spent so much time with people at, you know, the end of their life. And so I really want you to share just kind of, you know, some thoughts on how the your profession as a hospice worker has informed, you know, you and your teachings about living a regret-free life. You know, it was funny when I started to discover financial independence, I realized fairly quickly that getting to financial independence, the how is not actually very hard. You can go out, you can study, you can read a bunch of good books, and you can find out how to maximize your money and investments and get to financial independence. The harder question was the why. Once we're financially independent, what do we do with it? How does that translate into living a good life and being happy? I realized very quickly that the surface answers of, it's fun to travel and I wanna sit on the couch and play video games, weren't really good answers. Like we as human beings need more, especially those of us who are achievement oriented because you don't get to financial independence until you're, unless you're pretty achievement oriented. People like us need more than those surface answers. So I was struggling with those questions through my writing and eventually podcasting. And I started realizing that, you know, who has the answers to these kind of questions? My dying patients, the mm. patients I was taking care of in hospice given the clarity of knowing that they only had weeks or months to live, all of a sudden became very clear about what was important in life and why. And interestingly enough, none of them really talked much about money. I mean, unless they didn't have enough money for the most basic of needs, none of them would say, I really regret that I didn't earn more money. I really regret that I didn't spend more nights or weekends in the office. What they tended to regret is that they never did things that were important to them, that they never had the courage to pursue those deep internal wants because it was so scary they never took the time or that they never fixed those important relationships. So that's what I started finding out, that people who were dying regretted the things they didn't have the courage or energy to pursue, but that were important to them. And so a lot of people ask me, how do you have a good death? Like they know I'm a hospice doctor. People worry about dying all the time. They don't want it to be painful. They ask me, well, how do you... Ha Live, have a good death. And I say, well, the people tend to die the way they live. If you want a good death, you've got to live a good life. And if you want to live a good life, you have to start asking yourself the question, what will I bemoan lying on my be deathbed that I never had the energy, courage, or time to do? What will I regret that I didn't do? And instead of waiting until you only have a few weeks or months to live and trying to meet those needs, Let's start talking about that stuff now when we're young, when we're hopefully healthy, and when we have the energy and time to start using all these tools we have, including money, but our passion, our youth, our energy, our friends, our relationships. Let's start using all those tools 
to start pursuing those things that are important to us now to start setting off on these climbs so that when we one day get to our deathbed, so when you one day read, meet a doctor like me, you won't have regrets because you will be living an intentional life from the start and trying to reach some of these more important, deeper goals in your life. Yeah, I absolutely love this because essentially, you know, through the art of subtraction, as well as I would say the art of financial independence, you can actually proactively create the energy, like you can get enough energy back by like, you know, actually being like mastering your money and getting that in place and then subtracting the work out of your life, both in your professional life and your domestic uh, work life, subtracting that out so you have both the energy and the time. And then, you know, with energy and time, courage becomes a lot easier to put into play especially if you focus on, you know, really uh, building re great relationships and building up great skills, right? Because the only way to get like, you know, uh, confident in anything is by doing it, right? So if you start by carving out the energy and the time, you can start to do the side hustle that you're going to suck at in the beginning, but it's like yeah. much more meaningful work that may cost you money to do in the beginning, but then you start to get good at it and then you can actually start to like make money doing it, which then creates more energy and potentially more time and more courage to like, it's an iterative process. It's that incremental yeah. gain that you, you know, uh, illustrated for us uh, earlier. So I absolutely love this. I have a question for you though. What if you don't know your purpose? So I think that's really, really common actually. And so, the first thing I tell people is chill out. That's fine, right? <laughs> so people get really stressed out and they get stressed out about finding their purpose. I think most people deep down inside actually have an inkling of their purpose, but they've never taken the time or the energy or given themselves the quietness to think about it. Mm. So in the book, there's a series of exercises that help you deal with purpose, identity, and connections. But when it comes to purpose, you know, I love that visualization, just the one minute visualization that we talked about when it comes to being on your deathbed. If you can imagine yourself lying on your deathbed, what would you regret that you never had the energy, courage, or time to do? And I really tell people to meditate on that for sometimes days, weeks, or months. It's the same idea of writing your own eulogy, right? Um, we need to start being more thoughtful. We need to start doing what I call a life review process. This is something we do with hospice patients all the time, but we should be doing it early on in our life and start really thinking about what has had meaning in our life, what skills, habits, and relationships were important to us, what have we gained, what have we lost, and why. And we have to start doing this on a regular basis. We have to start listening to ourselves and if none of that works, you have to start throwing the spaghetti against the wall and trying a bunch of things, volunteering, hanging out with people you normally don't hang out with, doing things you don't normally do. We have to open ourselves up to the world and see what feels special or important. Your purpose doesn't have to be something that'll save the world. Like if climate changes your purpose, great. But if your purpose is collecting modern art, you know, that's great also. Your purpose can change from time to time. You can have one purpose or many but most people never even give themselves to the time to sit back and think about it. We get so caught up in money and career and all these things we think are measures of success, but that don't actually fuel us. They don't actually give us that energy that sometimes we completely ignore this idea that sometimes we need to sit still with ourselves and think about what lit us up. When was the last time you woke up in the middle of the night excited by an idea and couldn't fall back asleep? Did you pursue that idea? Most people answer no, because by the time they wake up the next morning, they have work to go to and things to do. And they say it was a silly thought and no one does that. And they move on. I'm encouraging you to go back to those things and start thinking about, well, what really lights you up? Even if you didn't have society's permission, even if you told yourself it was undoable. And I think that's where we have to go back to that well and start thinking about what's really important for us. I know for me... It was not hard to connect to that well because I knew I loved writing and communicating. Not everyone has it that straightforward. They know they have something they love to do, but they've been pushing it away because they're too busy. Uh, but if you don't start thinking about it, you can't succeed. And it's okay if it takes a while. Like it's not something to get nervous or worried about. It's not something to get anxious about. I think you just have to approach it 
in a series of ways and do some of these exercises and meditate on it and look back at your life and what was important to you. And I think the answers eventually come. Yeah, I I totally agree. And I think one of the easiest things to do is just like pursue the things that are interesting to you until they either turn into a purpose or you get bored of them and you move yep. on to the next thing. Totally. And if you just keep following the interest, like whatever excites you, eventually you'll be like, oh, here's my purpose. Um, but if you never carve out the time and the energy to pursue your interest because, you know, you're a slave to your mortgage or whatever it is, because uh, the way you've built your financial life is like basically sucking, you know, all your time and energy, like you never have the space to pursue those interests, which means you'll never find your purpose. I will tell you for sure what catches people is not that they can't figure out their purpose. What catches them is they don't give themselves the time or energy to pursue it. And usually it's out of fear, right? We're very, very afraid to step away from the measurable goals like our net worth or like our position in our career. All of those things are easy and simple and knowable. It feels really awkward and uncomfortable to step away from those measurable things and start to try to think about things that are more ephemeral, right? Yeah. Things that don't have clean beginnings or endings, things that you can't put a flag down and say, I've now reached my goal. My suspicion is we're very afraid of those things because it reminds us that we're dying from the day we're born, that we have a set amount of time on this earth. And to put some time thinking about these larger, bigger, true goals in our life feels so scary because it's also to admit that time is finite and we don't like to do that. It's much easier to push those aside and think about things that are easy and measurable like money. Yeah. Yeah. And money is really like, you know, the ego is fed by money and net worth. Mm -hmm. Like, what's my mm -hmm. net worth? And the ego is fed by like job titles and power at work. And I, I literally had to go through this. So there was a, a few times at my company where they're like, we'd like you to become like the VP of sales and manage all the salespeople. And my ego wanted that <laughs> job, yeah. but like my spirit was like, no, I want the freedom and autonomy to like set my own schedule and do what I love to do, which is connect with the clients and share the vision of the company and the mission of the company with clients. That's what I love to do. And that's what I'm really good at. So ultimately it was really tough. I had to talk to my wife about it. And I was like, cause you know, my ego wanted that title for sure. And fortunately my wife was like, no, no, no. Like you need to like keep yourself free because your time and your ability to kind of like manage that yourself is so important to you. So I, I I've maintained, like, I'm just the top salesperson at the company, but as long as I, you know, perform, they don't really care how I spend my time. But, uh, and then I recently had to battle that with the house, right? Because my ego says as like a successful businessman, like entrepreneur, salesperson, I should be living, I should own a really nice home in the Bay. And my ego says that, but my spirit is like, no, you need to stay financially free so that you can be free to pursue the purposeful work that lights you up. Yeah. And I mean, in this case, you know, ego and autonomy are actually almost opposites, right? Mm. Because ultimately the goal for all of us is not that we don't have friction in our lives, but that we choose what friction we have in our lives. And sometimes when you pursue ego, you go for these things you think are important, you end up being controlled by them. Yeah. Right. So the big jobs control us. You end up doing lots of things you don't like doing because you have to for the job. Yeah. Whereas what I think true independence and freedom are uh, above and beyond what money is, is when I look at my life, I have good days and bad days. I have busy days and unbusy days. I have stressful days and peaceful days, but every single stressful day I have when it comes to at least the work I do is completely because I chose to do that. Hmm. Like I could have a day where I have to record three podcasts and I have to do all sorts of prep work and that's stressful and busy, mm -hmm. but I chose that stress. That was yeah. my decision. And if tomorrow I decide I want to scrap it and do none of it, I have that autonomy. And it's the exact opposite of ego, actually. It's it's freedom. Yeah. No, I think that is absolutely brilliant. That ego and autonomy are literally, in many cases, opposing forces. That is a huge takeaway for me. Amazing. So 
I'm curious now that you're at the place that you're in, you know, a first quick question. Are you still doing hospice work? I still do about 10 to 15 hours a week. Okay. Um, I do have kept doing it because ultimately it brings me joy to be involved. I have to tell you that may change. I have to see. Um, (laughs) I, the company I worked for got bought by another company and I don't like them nearly as much. Mm. So far I've been fairly insulated because what I do is very prescribed and specific. And so they're, they can only change my job so much, Mm -hmm. but I'm leaving the option of not doing that anymore if working for this company becomes too burdensome but that also is sad for me because i like the work yeah and i have a very unique role in which i can do this so i i run teams so i don't actually even see patients anymore mm-hmm. i pretty much support nurses chaplains social workers and certified nursing assistants in their work and helping hospice patients and i feel that's very empowering because pretty much i help the frontline caregivers do the amazing things they do mm-hmm. um but it's always a continuous measure of is the friction caused by this worth my time? And if the friction gets too high, then I can subtract that out. And that's always something I'm considering. Yeah, I love it. So my my question uh, after, you know, are, are you still doing hospice is, you know, at this stage in your life, like how do you purposely and intentionally like create your best life like what does that look like now like what are the things that you find like support that so i've pretty much engaged in a series of climbs that make the moments i spend feel purposeful so for me like i said podcasting is exceedingly purposeful and i do that about 20 30 hours a week between the social media and the podcast and the booking and all that kind of stuff doing hospice work is incredibly meaningful to me now and it's very purposeful so i do about 10 to 15 hours a week doing that I spend at least two hours exercising of some kind, whether that's taking long walks or stretching or yoga or something. I spend another at least two hours a day doing some kind of reading. I love reading for pleasure, reading that has no redeeming qualities other than it just satisfies me and it's enjoyable. And so I do a lot of that. And so what I continuously look for are opportunities to feel engaged, opportunities in which I enjoy the process even more than the product, whatever it'll create. Mm. And most importantly, ways to connect to other people. Like the big joy of doing what I've done through personal finance and writing this book and podcasting is I created a group of friends, a group of connections which feel deeper and more aligned than I ever had in life. And part of the reason was, is I kept on trying to make these connections with other doctors When my identity, really this thing that I thought was being a doctor, didn't really fit me real well. So once I realized that I was more of a communicator, I was more of a creator, I was able to align myself with people like that. And I thus been able to make much tighter, better, deeper connections. And that is gratifying. And above and beyond that, I don't think I need any more. Like I taking, trying to take the advice of my own book, I've tried to decide what I would regret in life on my deathbed, and I've tried to systematically go back and make sure those things are no longer regrets. And in many ways, I've mostly done that. So I'm going to look for things that feel purposeful and joyful and and celebrate relationships. And that's what I think living the rest of a good life looks like to me. I love that. So my last topic that I want to cover with you before we kind of like shut this down is definitely self-interested. So one of the things that I've always dreamed of doing is writing a book and ever since I was like very young and, you know, I'm still kind of like, I haven't even started that yet. You know, I think I've, I've done the prep work, you know, writing the blog stuff. Like I treat my Instagram like a mini blog. Most of my posts are like, you know, have very long written out captions. I feel like you kind of uh, had a similar kind of dream to write a book. And I'm just curious if you can share with me kind of like, what finally got you over the hump to start writing the book or, you know, just any coaching or advice that you would have uh, for somebody in my position in regards to finally writing a book? So I had a dream of traditionally publishing a book. So I had written books before, mostly groups of blog postings that I had put together and actually Mm. put them in book form and self-published them. Gotcha. But the truth of the matter is, I had a dream of doing more than just that. I actually wanted to go the traditional route. I wanted to have a traditional editor. I wanted to have someone help me with 
the graphic design and all those kind of things. But I think I'd always been afraid. It was one of those things for me that was a climb, but it was such a scary climb. I was so afraid, even in my state where I had failed a lot and that had been okay, I was even still afraid of failing at this. And I have to thank a friend who really pushed me in a positive way. My friend Grant Sabatier had written a pretty successful book. He was very into the financial independence movement. He had been reading my blog for years. And one day he sat me down and he said, dude, you need to make this into a book. He said, your voice is unique. This is something that's never been out there. Um, and I'd really like to see this book written. And I can't think of anyone else but you to do it. And in a way, he gave me the permission to pursue this thing that was so fearful for me, but he also provided me concrete help. So things I had struggled with in the path is how do you get an agent? How do you do a book proposal? All these things that are kind of nebulous and they're out there and you can read about them, but it never sat well with me. And he came and said, you know what? I'll introduce you to my agent. I'll help you do a book proposal. Here's a book I read. Go ahead, write your book proposal, send it to me. I'll work with you on it. We'll fix it, blah, blah, blah. So he gave me some actual physical and knowledge tools, which I needed. And then he also gave me the permission. Hmm. And he helped me realize that this was one of my climbs that I kept on putting off because it was scary. And I realized that if not, it, it was like, you're never going to get a better time. Here's something you can write about that is salient and that's important and that people are talking about now. Here is a resource, someone who's gone through that, who's willing to sit there and coach you through it. Like if I didn't jump at that, I knew that there was never going to be a better time. And so I jumped in and it was hard. I mean, it took years. I messed up. I had to rewrite my draft a few times. The first draft I sent to Grant, he read it. He's like, this is not a book. Like <laughs> he was like, I'm sorry. And I love what you have to say, but this isn't it. And so I had to go through a bunch of rewrites. I sent out to a bunch of publishers. A lot of publishers turned it down. I finally found one that didn't. Then I had to do all the edits. There was insecurities. Then the vulnerability of putting it out there, being afraid no one would buy it, being afraid no one would read it, being afraid that my life story wouldn't be important or have meaning. All that was part of the process. And it was very, very vulnerable in ways that I've never felt vulnerable before. Like I've, I've gone, let me tell you, I've gone up and given talks on stages in front of hundreds of people. And one of them, I actually performed a live rap that's pretty damn vulnerable, right? But that was nothing near what writing a book felt like. But the upside to that is now I have this thing that I've done that can never be taken away from me. I have all these positive experiences. I went and talked. I gave a talk in Mexico City recently based on my book. I would have never been asked to do that unless I had written this book, right? Um, I get people who email me and say, thanks, that book really helped me or this had meaning or I really took this away from your book. All of these things would have never happened unless I had the courage to do the climb. Thank God my friend Grant was willing to push me on it and that I was in the right place and time to do it. But I would say if you're willing to put in the work and realize that it is very vulnerable work, um, it's also incredibly gratifying. Hey there. Just a few words about the incredible show sponsors for today's episode, and then we'll dig right back in. Today's show is brought to you by Fit Rich Vegan. If you're ready to get in the best shape of your life, double your income, and 10x your savings and investments, then this is the coaching program for you. But wait a minute, Dragon. Isn't this your coaching program? Heck yeah, it is. I spent the last eight years mastering my fitness and my finances, and I've built an incredible coaching program with an incredible team to help you get the body of your dreams and finally achieve that level of financial success that you've been seeking. So if you want to find out if you're a good fit for the program, go to fitrichvegan.com and book your free consultation today. Or you can just DM me on Instagram with the words fitrichvegan and we can chat about if it's going to be a good fit for you. I'm committed to empowering people to actually achieve their fitness and financial goals. I spent the last 20 years trying to figure this out on my own. And what I realized is the key to doing it is not doing it alone. You have to have coaches, you have to have mentors, 
and you have to be a part of masterminds. And that's exactly what Fitch Rich Vegan has. It has coaches, mentors, and it is a mastermind. So again, if you're ready to book your free consultation today, go to fitrichvegan.com or drop me a DM on Instagram. Yeah. Grant Sabatier, when him and Cody were traveling around promoting his book, yeah. he, uh, the two of them actually came to my Money Mastermind meetup and did a live presentation to my group at Stanford University, literally in this, like, you know how, like, uh, the Greek philosophers used to, like, sit under a tree and, like, there would be, like, people on, like, a, a stadium yeah. or a hillside? No joke, that was our setting because there was this natural like kind of like mini stadium with a tree in the middle of it and we did it right there and and that's how I met Cody and Grant Sabatier. And so it's just really beautiful to hear that he played a major role in your life because like, you know, not as major at anywhere near your, your level, but just I feel a sense of uh, kindredness uh, just knowing that like, he played a part in your life because, you know, he played a part in my financial journey and I absolutely loved his book, Financial Freedom. And and Cody has uh, definitely become a friend as well. So awesome. Well, are there any other topics or areas that you actually, there's one last topic that I have to cover with you. Do you have time? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So you and I are both financially free. So essentially... Uh, you know, or financially independent, same difference. And we're covered with the money. You know, before we started rec recording, we started talking about like the other people in our life that, you know, affect our emotional well being. So I'm just, I wanted to get your thoughts on that because I have found in my own life, even though I've created like a lot of financial security and that has given me a lot of freedom and confidence and happiness, I still worry about my parents and my brothers. So, Walk me through kind of like your current thoughts on that particular subject. I have to tell you, it's actually something that I get stuck on now. When you think about the evolution of your own needs, I feel like I've gotten to a place where I understand most of my own needs. I understand what I will and won't regret, hopefully, when that faded day reaches me when I'm on my deathbed. And I can mitigate those type of regrets by working on these things in life now. I feel great comfort in that. In fact, I feel a great peace that I'm getting to that place where I should be as a human being. But I'm also struggling with the fact that I also realize that for everything I can do to work on myself and be more the person I want to be, there are other people in my life who I care about deeply and I spend time stressing about them. So I've de-stressed my own life. I've come to a place where I feel like I'm getting closer to self-actualization or happiness, but I struggle with the struggles of my family, of my kids, of my wife, of my parents, of the hardships they go through. And it really makes you think about this idea of security, right? No matter how hard we struggle for our own security, whether it be financially or physically or what have you, life is an insecure thing, mm. right? And as one of my favorite sayings is none of us gets out of this life unscathed. Bad things happen. They happen to us and they're random and no matter how well we prepared for it, you can't stop it from happening and they happen to our family and friends. And so part of this realization is that I can get to a feeling of Zen calmness maybe about my own life, but it's okay if life isn't perfect and if it isn't calm and if I worry and stress about people I love because I love them. And you almost have to get to this point of acceptance where you realize that Sometimes the striving itself can become somewhat paradoxical or even maniacal. And on some level, you have to accept that we're human beings, which means that we can get to a place of calmness and happiness, but there's always going to be some disruption in our lives and in the lives of our loved ones. And that's okay. <laughs> like, there is no state of perfection. We are perfectly imperfect, and maybe that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So there's something to be worked on, at least in my own life, about releasing the need to control everything. Mm. Yeah. Because I think I've done a really great job of kind of like setting myself up to have like, you know, a ton of financial control. 
like, you know, being very well diversified, having multiple sources of income, having plenty of money, et cetera. But I can't control, you know, what my parents' health is or the, you know, the whatever goes on in my brother's lives uh, and their careers. And so there's almost like a, a, uh, a climb that needs to be made towards releasing control yeah. over like everything in life and surrendering maybe. Yeah. I, I like that surrendering. I mean, as you're saying this, I remember, and I don't even remember the story, but in one of my great books classes in college, we read The Tempest by Shakespeare, mm. right? The Tempest is not usually a play that everyone brings up when they talk about Shakespeare plays, but I don't remember anything about the story, but I remember the conclusion hinged on this idea that at some point there are parts of life you can't control and you have to throw your arms up and just accept, mm. right? Yeah, exactly. The word surrender is perfect. You surrender to the fact that the world is uncontrollable and that you are just this little pawn in this bigger story that maybe we don't all understand. And I also think about the stages of grieving, right? Denial, anger, bargaining, depression. But what's the last one? Acceptance. And mm. acceptance is kind of like a beautiful surrender, right? It's like I'm letting go of this idea that I can affect everything in life and just swaying with the wind and letting it take me wherever it's going to take me. And um, I think that's maybe that final step in, in, in starting to understand your own contentedness or happiness or self-actualization is letting go of that little last bit of control and realizing, um, yeah, we're all bobbing and floating in the ocean and we have very little control of where the current takes us. And maybe that's okay. Yeah. One other word that came up for me as well as is compassion for their life and their journey, right? Mm -hmm. So like surrendering, it's their journey, compassion, it's their life. They're going to do it how mm -hmm. they want to do it. And, you know, kind of what I was thinking is like back to the, like the stories that we tell about ourselves could also be like, what are the stories that we're telling about our parents or our family members and how can we turn those into magical stories, right? that like what they're going through, you know, like here's a perfect example. So my dad has prostate cancer and has been really, you know, challenging. But the thing is, it is in a sense created the most close uh, relationship that I've ever had with my father, right? So cancer has actually been like a beautiful, you know, almost like awakening of my relationship with my father and witnessing him coming into such deeper touch with his own emotions is just been, you know, really beautiful and intimate and, and vulnerable. And so like when I frame cancer through that lens, then his life becomes a magical part of my life. Right. And then kind of building on the others, uh, the climb part of the happiness, I think is for me is like, how can I surrender and and be in acceptance and have compassion, but also making a climb towards like always just working towards like, you know, creating or empowering them to have a better life, whether that's through financial mm -hmm. support or, you know, just getting on the phone and connecting with them. Cause I know that's so important to them or, you know, uh, sharing some of my own failures and learnings to empower their own journey. Cause you know, one of the things my dad loves so much about our conversation and he tells me this almost every conversation is how much he learns from me. Yeah. So, and that's, you know, really feels good as a son. It's like, oh, heck yeah. I'm like, even my dad is still a learner. And that makes me happy because like my love of learning is so big. So that was a really good subject to go into, Jordan. I, I appreciate you uh, going there with me. So as we kind of start to wrap this up, are there any last things that you want to talk about uh, or ideas or request the audience or words of wisdom that you would like to leave with the audience? The words of wisdom I have, and they, they specifically come from my book, is I think we spend too much time thinking about our finances and not thinking enough about our purpose and identity. So what I always tell people is mm. start trying to figure out what those climbs are in your life. Maybe even put the finances to the side for a few days or weeks or months while you think about what a good climb looks like to you. And then once you've done that, 
come back to the finances and build them around that climb or climbs, build them around purpose and identity. And I think that's the best way to really find happiness, not just tomorrow, not just in some future day when you retire, you're financially independent, but today, immediately, now, uh, while we're really maybe for some of us at the way beginning of this journey. Yeah. Doc G, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all your insight, wisdom, and life experience and you know dying experience. Really appreciate you. Thank you for having me. It was a great conversation. Thanks for tuning in. And remember, literally everything can be used as an opportunity to learn, to heal, to grow, and to transform. So whatever is going on in your life, choose to consciously and proactively harness that energy and use it to alchemize your life to the next level. If you enjoyed the show, please share it with a friend or on your favorite social media and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. As always, you can find me at Justin David Carl on Instagram and all the socials, as well as at alchemizelife.com on the web. Until the next time, sending you lots of energy and plenty of dragon magic. <laughs>